Britain's big decision. With just over a month to go until the UK votes on leaving the EU, we're asking what it could mean for the rest of Europe. Also on today's program, a breath of fresh air for Beirut. How one grassroots campaign is trying to tackle Lebanon's problems head on. And in picture this, protests, condemnation and celebrations. Bangladesh hangs an opposition leader for war crimes. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me Imran Garza. Britain will hold a referendum next month on leaving the European Union. Its Prime Minister David Cameron has negotiated what he says are improved terms if the UK decides to stay. But will it be enough to convince the British public? Polls show opinion is evenly split, with many people yet to make up their minds. And as the decision gets closer, attention across the continent is turning to what could be the biggest shake-up to the European project in decades. The EU could lose its second biggest economy and its second biggest army if Britain leaves. And perhaps more worryingly, if it survives and thrives outside Europe, it could encourage others to follow suit. Today's newsmaker then is Britain as we ask what a Brexit would mean for the rest of the EU. The clock is ticking as Britain's EU referendum draws nearer. It's never been that comfortable a relationship. Britain's bond with the EU has been pragmatic rather than passionate. Its affinity with Europe was best summed up by Winston Churchill. We are with them, but not of them. Britain isn't a founding member of the EU. Its entry was twice vetoed by the then French president, Charles de Gaulle. A contrast to the attitude of the current French leader. Britain has always leaned towards the West rather than across the English Channel. But as we make that choice, it surely makes sense to listen to what our friends think, to listen to their opinion. One powerful friend came out batting for Britain to stay, with a stark warning. If our focus is in negotiating with a big bloc, the European Union, to get a trade agreement done. And UK is going to be in the back of the queue. Der Wunsch besteht, Großbritannien als Mitglied der Europäischen Union zu erhalten. Colleagues of the German Chancellor were more direct. No new deals with Britain should they vote to go. Das sage ich mal als pragmatischer Politiker, wer raus ist, ist weg. And that is the fear. If Britain demands to rewrite the existing treaties, others across the continent may campaign for their own tailor-made deals. That could unravel the European Union as we know it. The anti-EU mood in many states may give rise to regional separatism in places like Catalonia, the Basque Country or Northern Italy. In economic and geopolitical terms, the EU will be weaker. The global economy may suffer too. We have clearly elevated Brexit as one of the uh, serious downside risks. The risk of exit of the United Kingdom is uh, a serious concern. Britain has never been part of the Eurozone, having negotiated an opt-out in the 1990s. But it does have the second largest economy in the European Union. I believe that Britain will be stronger, safer and better off by remaining in a reformed European Union. Within the UK, the respective sides are setting out their arguments. I want a better deal for the people of this country, to take back control. But if the arguments of Boris Johnson prevail and the UK votes to leave, could there be a European domino effect? In a recent survey of nine countries in the European Union, nearly half think that a British exit will lead to other nations going as well. Nearly as many said they wanted their own referendum on membership. A third of those asked said they would vote to leave the Union if they could. Almost half of the Italians and French said they would vote for an out. By comparison, just one in five Polish people would vote for their country to leave. It's not just the future of Britain within the EU that's going to be decided on June the 23rd, but the future of the Union itself. Francis Collings, The Newsmakers. 
Well, joining me now to discuss Brexit and its potential impact on the rest of Europe is Carsten Nickel in Brussels. He's a political risk analyst with Teneo Intelligence. And in London is Alex Dean, executive director of the Grassroots Out movement. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Alex Dean, why do you want to Thanks go? Thanks for having me. Oh, three main reasons, I think that, and I disagree, I'm afraid, with a lot of the premise of the package that I've just been listening to. Uh, sovereignty is deeply affected by the European project. I think you should be able to elect and then dismiss, if you wish, those who make up your laws. And of course, the UK is governed uh, not just by itself, but by representatives from 27 other nations. Uh, secondly, economics. Uh, we send a huge amount of money. There's been an argument in this country, which your viewers may or may not have, have seen, between, is it 350 million we send to Europe? Europe every week, or is it only 300 million? Well, uh, either way, it's a lot of money, and I think that money could be better spent uh, here in the UK. And thirdly, and of course on a Turkish channel particularly interesting, immigration. It was Ronald Reagan who said that a country that cannot control its own borders is not really a country at all. Well, we don't have meaningful control of our own borders, notwithstanding the fact we're not in Schengen, uh, if we can't uh, really turn back anyone who's got a European passport. Carsten Nickel, does any of that convince you? No, not at all, unfortunately, I have to say, um, precisely because the days in which national politics can give the answers to these kind of questions, especially immigration, is over. We see it these days, uh, the significant investment that the European Union has made uh, into striking a deal with Turkey over migration, that shows you uh, how important it is to find regional, international solutions to these kinds of problems. But so it's a bad deal. I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing across... I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing across developed democracies these days is that you have the growth in uh, political fragmentation and populist parties um, precisely due to the fact that we're at a point in time where we have to move from national solutions towards more regional solutions and that creates a lot of political tension. Yeah, because, you, Carsten, that, that's because you don't trust people to be able to make decisions for their own countries and with all due respect, of course, you're dialing into us here from Brussels. Uh, that's where you uh, make your uh, bread and butter and and it's your, in your interest to have the European institutions coasting along. But here in Britain, we can see we get a very bad deal uh, out of the European Union. And the answer cannot be, as it's just been from you, well, we don't really uh, care about democracy so much, the nation state is dead, solutions lie more on regional bases because that is taking power away from where it belongs in the hands of the people and you many people i'm not saying you did this just now but many people sneer at the idea of people being able to decide their own future and decide what happens for them and they call it populism i just call it democracy carson why don't you okay criticize that sorry to interrupt you, you should be able to make up decisions for themselves Carsten, the worse it is carson why don't you address the money issue alex has mentioned that the uk pays more into the eu than it does get out why is it going to be lucrative for the United Kingdom to stick around? Well, the UK Good is question. not the only country that pays a lot into the uh, budget. If you look at it in terms of per capita contribution, maybe you should have a conversation with our Dutch friends who are actually the highest contributor there. You could also talk about Germany. Many of these economies in Northwest Europe pay in a lot. Um, and the simple reason for this is that That's what true. you do is essentially you buy membership in a club that um, increases your global influence and you buy access to one of the largest markets in the world. On top of all that, I think um, a central premise of uh, this pro-Brexit conversation is that you could control your own borders um, uh, as uh, of the day that you decide to leave the European Union. The plain truth is, um, if you want to have access to the European single market, look at Norway, look at Switzerland, you will have to strike a deal with the European Union um, that respects the freedom of movement. So in that sense, a lot of this debate, unfortunately from my perspective, is bogus. Okay. Alex, let's look at the middle ground here. We, you have a negotiation sure. that took place. Prime Minister David Cameron negotiated with, with the Europeans. You have special status, greater autonomy as a sovereign state, plus you get to keep what all the good bits status? that you want. You Come get to on. keep all the good bits that, that, that you want from the European Union. It's win-win. No. Why would you want anything it's, else? No, I'm afraid you, 
you, uh, I have no criticism of you, of course, but there's no reason for you to pay close attention to the negotiating process, but that's not true. Uh, what we've wound up with is actually a deal that is substantially worse for the United Kingdom, if anything, rather than better. Uh, whilst you're right, lip service is paid to the end of ever closer union, uh, at least for the United Kingdom. What does that actually mean? Uh, it doesn't make any substantive difference. What we gave up in our treaty negotiations was the veto over further integration in the Eurozone for Eurozone countries. And that was a significant negative power, if you like, that the United Kingdom had, that we no longer have as a result of the so-called negotiations the Prime Minister had. I don't even think Carsten would pretend that we've had a significant reform of the European Union or a reform of the United Kingdom's position in it as a result of the Prime Minister's negotiations. Alex, are you happy to go to the back of the queue, as President Obama put it? Yeah, I thought that was regrettable. The, the, the President of the United States is entitled to have a view about uh, Britain's position vis-à-vis -vis the European Union. He's also entitled to express it. But the absurd thing uh, is to have a view that is so hypocritical because you would not urge your own country to go down the path that you're asking your allies to take. Uh, the President of the United States would never uh, suggest that his country should join a social and political union like the uh, European Union. Of course, whilst they're in NAFTA, uh, the Americans have nothing like the same. They wouldn't enter into a uh, court system that gave jurisdiction to the Venezuelans or the Colombians. Remember, the Americans haven't even signed up to the International Criminal Court. They're far less involved in international organizations rather than more than us. Carsten, President Obama, was he a concerned international citizen just speaking his mind or was he playing dirty and trying to tilt the debate? You know what? It doesn't really matter. The only point is that you have a large pro-Brexit camp in the UK which says on the next day after leaving the EU we're going to strike a great, amazing, quick negotiated uh, trade deal with the United States. And here you have Barack Obama saying actually no, we're not going to do that. So it doesn't even matter whether you know this is the right thing for Obama to say, whether he's a loyal friend if he says it or not. The fact of the matter is Obama said no. And you know what? Um, if you look at the uh, logic of politics in the US these days, this is probably the outgoing president now is probably the most free trade president we're going to have in a long while. Uh, if you're looking at the statements from Hillary Clinton, let's not even talk about Trump. Uh, when it comes to new trade agreements, I'm very skeptical. So again, it doesn't really matter whether this is fair or not mm. fair. It's a matter of fact that majorities in favor of trade agreements are dwindling across the developed world. And in that sense, it's a stupid idea to leave an integrated Carsten, market like the European Union. If I may Union. say, it's a, it, it's, a very, it's a very Brussels centric perspective that comes down to that view, rather than thinking about it from the interest of the British people. Not only are we the largest customer of the European Union, on the day we leave the EU, our all-time high trade deficit running with the EU means that we will be the EU's largest trading partner. But we are the large, we being Britain, are the largest investor in the United States. The United States is the largest investor in the United Kingdom. Now, it's only one of many trade deals we might enter into when we leave the European Union. But to suggest that it's an impossibility is daft. I mean, that's the conspiracy theory. And when you were arguing Carsten, that uh, the ability to uh, en enhance your trade and negotiation position through the EU uh, is made by membership, I think it's, you've got it the wrong way around. We are unable to negotiate our own trade deals because of our membership of the European Union. And any people who are from Turkey or a Turkish audience people watching this uh, show should reflect on the fact, as Turkey draws closer to European uh, Union membership itself, that the United Kingdom does not have a seat at the WTO negotiating table because we are represented okay. there by the European Union. Alex, we I want to ask you about... We seat at the highest table. Uh, and no other country should do it. Sure, Alex, we're running out of time. I want to ask you about Eurosceptic nationalist movements, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, and this domino effect. Yeah. Is that scaremongering from those who want Britain to stay in? Or is it very likely that because of you guys, the whole ship might sink and this will trigger all these Eurosceptic movements across the continent to want to break away? Oh, I think it's very likely that Euroscepticism will be on the rise, whether the United Kingdom votes to leave the EU or not. Uh, that's because the EU is getting worse and worse. It still can't balance its own books. It never gets signed off by auditors or accountants. And I think that you're going to see more and more people likely to uh, voice Eurosceptic positions, whether the UK remains in or whether, as I wish us to do, we vote to leave. What's happened to Greece? Real austerity, uh, where their country has been driven into the mud. You know, a generation of Greeks sacrificed 
on the altar of the European Union project. That's the kind of thing that makes people Eurosceptic. When Britain leaves, it will show that it's possible to leave, and it will show that it's possible to unwind the ratchet of the European Union. So it will encourage people to think about their position. But the main thing driving it isn't the British referendum. The main thing driving it is what the EU is doing to its member states. Carsten, Alex looks as if he's looking forward to it, or he sounds as if he's looking forward to it. You sound as if you are not. Just how afraid are you of individual countries breaking away? one by one over the forthcoming months Yeah, that is a serious years. risk. It is a serious risk, um, uh, that's, that's for sure. At the same time, it could play out the other way. Um, and in that sense, Greece is a very good example. If you look back there a couple of years ago, when Syriza um, started uh, to do very well in the poll and was thinking about the idea of leaving the European Union, um, you had a more or less united front from the Eurogroup pushing back and holding the line vis-a-vis -vis Greece. And that actually played out quite badly for other Eurosceptic movements in other countries, if you think of Podemos in Spain, which back then took a massive hit in the polls. What does this tell us for Brexit? Well, you know, the vote is one thing. What is going to ensue is two years of tough negotiations. And my biggest worry is that many in Britain will wake up on the next morning and find themselves in a very, very tough negotiation process with the European Union, because many leaders, just think of François Hollande, the French president who's facing massive concurrence and competition uh, from the Front National, uh, that many leaders will feel forced to push back um, in these negotiations and take a very hardline stance against the UK. So I don't think this Brexit, if oh. voters decide in favor of it, is going to work very smoothly. Okay, gentlemen, it's been good to hear both your thoughts. It's been absorbing. Thank you very much for joining us, Carsten. Thanks very Alan. much. Tells the on the newsmakers how some Beirutis have been making a stand against Lebanon's sectarian status quo. And in picture this, how the war for independence is still dividing Bangladesh four decades on. Lebanon's political system was designed to ensure an equal balance of power between the country's three main sects. But it's also created political deadlock and voter apathy. In Beirut's municipal elections, voter turnout was just 20% as the establishment won again. But this time, they were run close by a grassroots organization eschewing the politics of the past. The newsmaker's Yvette McCullough explains. Beirut, a capital city, at the mercy of a stagnant political system. It's been gripped by a rubbish crisis for months, as authorities have failed to deliver basic services. But now Beirut has seen the emergence of a new political movement, fueled by anger and despair, and fed up with the mainstream. We are counting on the silent majority that we felt is frustrated, desperate and not hopeful in any movement anymore. The Beirut Medinity, or My City List, stood in municipal elections at the weekend. It's the first time Lebanese voters have gone to the polls in six years. Beirut Medinity put forward 24 candidates without links to any political party. They were evenly divided between Christian and Muslim and male and female. It campaigned for greater transparency and to challenge the status quo. They were up against the Beirutis list, a unified bloc of the dominant political parties headed by former Prime Minister Saad Hariri. Beirut Medinity didn't win any seats, but got around 42 to 43 per cent of the vote. Voter turnout, though, was very low, at only 20 per cent. Some see that result as a sign that people no longer care or of how entrenched the establishment is. But others believe there may be hope ahead to cure the country's paralysed politics. Lebanon has been hamstrung by its sectarian political system. It hasn't held parliamentary elections since 2009. And it has been without a president for two years, as political factions cannot agree on a candidate. And despite Beirut Medinity's defeat, there are signs that their dissatisfaction is being heard. These elections and the campaign that went along were an occasion to hear all the different opinions. And I am sure that your new municipal council will take into consideration all the positive and constructive suggestions. This election has also sparked calls for parliamentary elections. 
It was said that the justification to extend the mandate of the parliament was security. The one who can carry out the municipal elections cannot say that he can't do parliamentary elections. Therefore, the excuse is no longer valid. Beirut Medinity's challenge to the political establishment is the first of its kind in Lebanon. And some say it could mark the start of a new political era. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Beirut to discuss Lebanon's newest political movement uh, is Beirut Medinity candidate Abdel Halim Jaber. Thanks a lot for joining us, uh, Mr. Jaber. How did you manage to do so well and disrupt the status quo in a place where people generally, usually uh, vote along religion or, or sect? How did you do it? I think uh, we simply made sense. Uh, we're a program-based campaign. Uh, we have very uh, sensible ideas in terms of what the city needs. We recognize uh, deficiencies in past administrations. We did our homework. We looked at various studies uh, and we synthesized them uh, in a very logical and integrated way. And we listened to people and we know how to project their concerns. And of course, we uh, campaigned on the ground, we reached into neighborhoods, we met with citizens, we listened to them as well. And um, that's basically how we did it. Mm -hmm. Now, usually politics in Lebanon and politics in, in Beirut particularly is sort of the microcosm of all that's going on in the region, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Iraq and, and so on. But this time around, with this municipal election, was it really all about who gets to pick up the trash? Uh, no, there's more to it. Uh, although our approach is developmental, uh, at the root of uh, local uh, governance is politics. Uh, basically, people want a better brand of politics where, with transparency, participatory thinking, uh, and uh, you know, finite goals uh, and some accountability uh, along the way. Okay, let me expand this for a second. It's not a big country, and what happens in Beirut, particularly in municipal elections, can undoubtedly resonate throughout the country. There's been no president for two years. There's been political uh, deadlock for a long, long time. Who's to blame for that? The system. We have a very uh, divisive, uh, confession-based system, whereby the only mode of representation is whether you're a Sunni or an Orthodox Christian or what have you. And basically what, what we're trying to do within Beirut Medinati is to shift this paradigm into uh, uh, civilian, uh, civic-based concerns, you know, what, you know uh, income groups, gender issues, uh, everyday life concerns, and not existential, uh, identity-based, uh, and rather antiquated ways of uh, seeing constituencies. While the war is raging next door in Syria, can you ever be successful? I think we're beginning to be, we, I mean, basically uh, what we, the 42% or 43% representation that we achieved uh, is, a, is an indication that people want this kind of change. They, they've heard us. Unfortunately, because of the ineptness of our uh, government, elections were not really confirmed until very late in the process. We only had two weeks of visibility. We announced our uh, list of candidates on April 22nd. And basically, uh, these are remarkable results if you factor in the, the short timing uh, that we had. We're not a political party, people don't know us, and yet we reach their hearts and minds. We appeal to them uh, as potential uh, civic leaders for local governance, and 40% uh, of them said, yes, we can trust you. Okay, Abdel Halim Jabir, good to hear your thoughts. Looking forward to chatting to you again sometime soon. Thank you very much. In today's picture this, there have been celebrations and protests in Bangladesh after the execution of opposition leader Muti Rahman Nizami. Let's take a look.
Today's newsmaker has been Britain as we asked what would happen if it left the European Union. Its position on the continent's western edge has fostered an island mentality that appears at odds with the grand European project. But its departure would undoubtedly have an impact on the rest of Europe. Losing one of its biggest economies during an ongoing Eurozone crisis would create friction in the member states and it would boost Eurosceptics across the continent. But if Britain leaves, the real test will be in the years to come and depends on whether it flourishes or fails without Europe. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye-bye.